Honford Star is a little independent publishing house run by two fantastic people, Anthony and Taylor. When Books and Bow first started, we were living in Seoul. We met Taylor from Honford Star a few times, and one of those times, we were at a cafe somewhere in Itaewon or Myeongdong or something in Seoul, and Taylor comes along and he sits down at our table and he just plops down in front of us a big Burger King bag full of new Honford Star books that are due to come out in the next few weeks and months. And that was yeah, that was the, the beginnings of Honford Star and Books and Bow. We barely knew what we were doing at the time and Honford Star were big dreamers with big ambitions and a Burger King bag. And I think it's absolutely beautiful. And to look at something as gorgeous as this, a book of this caliber. To look at this and see how far they've come is quite remarkable. Honford Star are great. One of the coolest things about them is their cover design. Taylor actually recently wrote a piece on their cover design for our website. You can go and read it. I'll put a link to it in the description. Taylor is very, very proud of their cover designs because with one minor exception, every single book that they have ever published, the cover art was designed by someone from that country. All of their Korean books have cover designs by Korean painters and artists. Same for their books from Taiwan. I won't go into too much detail because you can go read Taylor's article. It's very witty, very clever, as Taylor is. And another thing that I love about them is something that should be industry standard, as should getting local artists to do the artwork, by the way. But another thing that should be industry standard is naming the translator. You've got the name of the writer here, and underneath you've got the name of the translator. Naming the translator isn't difficult. Putting the translator on the cover isn't difficult, and yet all the big publishers don't do it, and you have to rely on the small presses to do it, and Honford Star do it. So Honford Star are great. This is their newest book, Tower. Tower is exciting for one big reason. It is the first, to my knowledge, piece of Korean science fiction in English translation. There's a lot of great Korean novels out there. A lot of my favorite books ever are Korean novels in translation. Most of them are literary fiction, historical fiction, commercial fiction, maybe horror, not much real genre fiction, fantasy, science fiction. You can't find it. And that's so weird to me. Tower has come along to fix that. Tower is written by Bae Myung-hoon, and he is one of Korea's big beloved sci-fi writers, at least according to the research that I've done. Now we have Tower in English translation. Tower was translated by Song Ryu, who is a Singapore-based Korean to English translator, and she has done a really great job with this, which is great because I'm pretty sure this is the first book of hers that I've actually read as a translator, and she has a bunch of books coming out in 2021. She's a very busy translator, translator right now, so I can't wait to read more of her books if this is the kind of standard that she sets for herself. This is fantastic. As I've said, cover design as well is absolutely beautiful. I've sat on this statement for a little while while I was reading this book, and I think I'm prepared to go on record as saying that this is my favourite book cover ever. This is an absolutely stellar piece of artwork. You can't see it here, but all around the border, of this piece of art, which is obviously the tower, the titular tower. All around here on the border are little images which go into tiny detail about the stories that you'll find in this book. Each one kind of symbolizes something that happens in the story, and it's a wonderful touch, and even the back is gorgeous as well. This is a stunning cover, and I don't think I've ever seen a prettier one. Tower is speculative science fiction. It's not science fiction in the sense that it has space travel, time travel, cloning, scientific experimentation, anything like that. It's speculative fiction. Tower is about a tower. The titular tower is called Beanstalk, and it's a country. It's never named where this country is, but it's very clearly supposed to be in South Korea, somewhere in near bordering Seoul. Beanstalk is a big tower that houses half a million people. 500,000 residents and workers live and spend their entire lives in this first ever completely urbanized country. It's massive, 600 and something floors, and it has everything in it that makes up a city. Every kind of infrastructure, every kind of job, every kind of system that a city requires can be found here. The book is about 200 pages, and it covers six stories. The stories are interconnected, but very, very loosely. 
The final three stories, the second half of the book, are far more clearly connected than the first three are. And each one serves two purposes. Every story serves to further build upon the world that Bae Myung Hoon has created here, while also creating a fully contained story. It is completely realized with unique characters, a beginning, middle, and end, and an arc for those characters to go on. So it's a short story collection. But it's also not, because every story is connected, every story is set in the tower, and every story serves to build upon the world and the mechanics of that tower. With every story that you read in this collection, you learn a little bit more about the tower, the people in it, the history of it, how it came about, and how it operates. It's a really unique approach to world building. Every story manages to create a kind of moral, political, ethical, social quandary for us to explore. It might offer some answers and explanations, or it might just be almost like a social experiment. And that kind of at times is what this book feels like. It's in a way a reflection of modern urban life. How do cities work? How are cities maintained? What are the intricate webs that make up a cityscape and the people within it? It feels like a city in a jar. And that's fascinating. So to take an example, let's look at the second story in the book, which is one of my favourites. My favourite two stories are stories two and three. And the second story is called In Praise of Nature, and it follows a writer. He's an author whose name is simply J. Is it J? Is it J? I hope it's J. K. It's K. <laughs> it's an author whose name is simply K, who has an editor whose name is simply D. Now, the book follows K's life fairly closely with the fact that he has what we call terrorphobia. He is frightened of the ground. He is frightened of earth. He's frightened of the natural world. And so he lives in Tower, a place where he never even has to touch the ground. He never has to be anywhere near open spaces. And he lives this life, and he is one day gifted a house on the Spanish coast. He's given this house on the Spanish coast, but more importantly, he's given a robot that lives inside of it, a robot that can be remote operated. And Kay basically uses this robot. He takes control of the robot through his computer with, you know, like a video game controller. And he looks out at the Spanish coast, the Spanish landscape and the interiors of this house as a means of escapism. He can't leave Tower, he's too afraid. But he can log onto his computer, take control of this actual robot, and live through its eyes and see the natural world safely through this window. Absolutely fascinating. But the world building that comes into it is the fact that this is a very corrupt place politically. You've got the mayor, and the mayor allows freedom of speech, freedom of publication. People can say and do whatever they want within reason. However, the mayor will subtly change laws and rules in order to restrict people when he feels like they're getting a little bit out of hand. So someone might write something that the mayor doesn't approve of. He'll allow that to be published, but then maybe later on he will change the law a little bit so that publication of something of that type becomes more difficult. So he creates red tape very subtly to try to curb people's behavior. Very, very clever. He doesn't outright say, you can't publish this, but he might change a rule here and there to make things more complicated for writers in the future. And Kay is afraid of this. And so Kay is writing, but Kay is starting to write more bland and boring stuff. And D, as his agent, she's getting really frustrated by this and doesn't understand why. As the story goes on, D actually factors into Kay's personal journey more and more in a really interesting and unexpected way, which I won't spoil. So you've got a really solid story about Kay, his terrorphobia, this robot in a house on the Spanish coast. And then you've got the world building, which revolves around freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and the way that the mayor contorts and controls laws and rules to his fancy. It's a great example of how you build a world while also telling a story, and that story is part of a large, larger scale and scope that makes up the entire book and the entire tower. Really fantastic stuff. Now, as I've said, the second half of the book, stories four, five, and six, actually connect together pretty well. They almost feel more like three chapters or three acts of one large story, in that civil unrest starts to build up within the tower more and more, and you see that civil unrest through different perspectives as we go. Really interesting stuff. There are things about the sixth story that I didn't like so much. It's a little convoluted, it flits between two different perspectives, and it relies on 
religious and cultural stereotypes that I don't really think do the book any favors, but I'm not gonna spoil it here. Just know that I didn't love it, and I'd be interested to know what you think once you've read it. One thing that I didn't like about the book and I'm reluctant to talk about it too much because I think it might have been my fault, is the very first story. The first story of the book is a very, very surreal tale. It's a story that follows a scientist who is experimenting with social behavior. It's obvious that this story is intended to build upon the world and establish certain social rules and connections within the tower, but it didn't make sense to me. This, this scientist starts off by talking about how currency is not the only currency. And there is also a currency of trade that goes on when it comes to giving and receiving gifts, uh, especially with regards to hierarchies, you know, bosses giving their employees presents for, for good work and employees giving their bosses presents at Christmas to say thank you for a good year or whatever. There is a social politeness system in place. We've all done this. We all know social hierarchies and management systems, etc., etc. And he's interested in how that system works within the tower and he's following this. So what he does is he looks at alcohol. We often gift bottles of wine and you might relate to this. If you've ever received a bottle of wine and you haven't drunk it, it was a gift, it was a Christmas gift, and then the next Christmas rolls around and you need to give someone else a present and you don't have anything and you give them that bottle of wine you never drank. I've seen my parents do it, I've done it, lots of people have done this. And that bottle of wine is now kind of a currency. That's the, the kind of premise of this first story. However, the story then devolves into this scientist's underlings, his three underlings becoming the central protagonist of the story as they suddenly go to a shopping mall to get a present for their head scientist's wife as she goes into labor. And they end up accidentally buying gold frankincense and myrrh for this child. And then when they go to the hospital, it turns out that the scientist has murdered his wife. I didn't get it. And I was so confused and I thought, wow, this is really trippy, surreal fiction that I can't follow at all. Move into the second story, the one I described about Kay, the writer and the robot. And I was like, wow, okay, I was bowled over by how good this was. And I felt like this was my true introduction to the book. And from here, everything made sense. However, the reason I'm blaming myself for the fact that I couldn't follow the first story in the book is because when I started reading it, I wasn't in a great mood. So there's a chance that I didn't make sense of the first story in this book because I was in an anxious spiral in my head and then I couldn't sleep that night. Anyway, not about me. Other than that story, which might have been my fault, this is a perfect book. This is a really, really great piece of speculative science fiction. As I've said, it is a book that succeeds on the fact that it blends world building with a short story narrative structure with telling very well realized and complete individual stories. So you've got a short story collection of six separate fantastic tales but they're not separate and they should be read in order. And as a complete whole, they build a tower. It's a very, very clever construct and I, I don't see things like this very often. I've recently been watching the, the Netflix TV version of Snowpiercer with David Diggs and uh, this kind of reminds me of that a little bit. In this social experiment, if you like, where you've got a sample of the human race all wedged into one place and how do we take the structures and mechanics of ordinary society and apply them to a smaller scale in a very claustrophobic, man-made urban environment? Very, very interesting stuff. And Tower really, really succeeds while also being sometimes very, very surreal. And it deals with a lot of social and political themes. One story later on where there are two kind of political ideologies, which are, I think they're called verticalism and horizontalism. And it talks about, uh, you know, basically horizontalism is kind of like socialism. It's, it's trade unions, workers' unions, workers' rights, etc. And then verticalism is kind of like capitalism, trickle-down economics, that kind of thing. It's not fully explored and it's not entirely emblematic. It's not a perfect allegory, but it's it's there. So even political ideologies are explored in this book. You've got political ideologies, you've got people being paid off, you've got social systems, you've got rules and laws being explored and how things get twisted and turned, a little bit about trade, a little bit of their relationships with what's called the neighboring country, which is obviously South Korea. There's a lot going on here. It's a pretty well thought out world. It, it's very, very clear that Bae Myung-hoon really understands social systems and political systems and economic systems well enough to create an allegory of a modern city within 
one single tower. It's clever stuff. And as I said, Song Ryu has done an incredible job here translating this book. Her translation is absolutely stellar. It's injected with wit and wisdom and a little bit of uh, flavor in terms of how its characters speak. You sometimes get an impression of certain dialects and personalities are really, really well expressed through choices of language that were obviously made by the translator because they are related to, say, certain dialects within the English language and they work really well. So the characters are very, very fully realized based on how they speak, slang that they use, the pace and tone and the structure of their sentences. The dialogue is sharply written, brilliantly translated, and I'm really, really excited to see what kind of things that Song Ryu is going to be translating very, very soon because she's a stellar Korean to English translator. Absolutely fantastic. So this is a great book. I'm very, very interested to see if I completely misread and misunderstood the first story in this book. Please let me know in the comments. And also tell me what you think about the cultural stereotypes that are tugged on a little bit too harshly in the sixth story. But stories two to five are perfect. Absolutely fantastic speculative science fiction, excellent world building, and subtly surreal and strange tales within their own right. One of them is about an elephant that might have reached Nirvana. So, if only one thing sells you on this book, let it be the elephant that potentially reaches Nirvana. Alright, so that's Tower. Honford Star are fantastic. I miss Taylor. He's a great guy. Go read his article that he wrote for our website. Read this book. It has my favourite cover, as I've said, ever. Beautiful cover. Beautiful book. The first ever piece of Korean science fiction in translation, I think. Certainly the first one that I've ever come across. And if this is what Korean science fiction literature is like, we need a lot more of it. This is a great place to start, so go read Tower. And, as always, subscribe for books.